show up on the screen, it's because I'm calling a slight audible. You can grab your Bible, you can open up to Isaiah chapter 61. This is what it says. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Come on, somebody. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, yes, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. Man, this is a promise. I hope this is like igniting some of your hearts right now. They will revive them. Though they have been deserted for many generations, foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Father, we thank you that the word of God is eternal. It never returns void. It will never pass away. It all points to you, King Jesus. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It is living, it is powerful, it is active. It is all profitable for exhortation, rebuke, and teaching to show us what's wrong in our lives and to help us live the calling that you predestined for us long ago. So Lord, we receive it right now in all humility. I pray, God, that you would refresh me with your spirit. May your people hear your voice and not my own. God, fill me up, let me be a vessel for you today. Speak to your children in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys can be seated again. If you guys are taking notes, I want you to write this at the top of your note-taking device. The title of this message is called Royal Pain. Oh, and everyone's like, oh, why did I show up today? This is not gonna sound like a good message. This, hey, this is an encouraging message, I can promise you that. Isaiah chapter 61, the title is Royal Pain. The first question I wanna ask you is, the most spiritual question you'll get all day. Who here has seen The Princess Diaries? So a lot of girl dads raising their hands right now. So I'm a girl dad myself. A lot of you know I'm a father of three children. Brave, our five-year-old. Raven, our four-year-old. She's our girl. And Quinn, our one-year-old. He turns two in September. And one of the blessings of being a girl dad is you get your arm twisted to watch movies that you otherwise would never watch. And for me, a few months ago, my daughter was inspired to watch Princess Diaries. And I'd watched it when I was a kid. And it was... Uh, it was really special to watch it again with her at this point in my life because I feel like I was able to, you know when you like, you watch a movie when you're a kid and then you watch it when you're older and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize like all the innuendos or I didn't realize like that's what they were talking about or there's things that you appreciate more because you're in a different season of life. And so I'm watching this movie kind of re reluctantly, but God is speaking to me profoundly through Mia Thermopolis. Princess of Genovia. If you don't know the story, let me kind of summarize it for you. So there's this girl named Mia Thermopolis. That's the weirdest name I've ever heard, now that I say it out loud. Mia Thermopolis. She's this teenage girl, and might I say, she's a little dorky. Her hair is all over the place. She's, just, uh, she's got these big, awkward glasses. And her one MO in life, in high school in San Francisco, is to be unnoticed to stay hidden in the background, because for her, high school is like the wild, wild west, and she, she has a difficult time making friends and not the popular girl at all. Life is a lot more comfortable for her to not be seen, to stay in the background, to kind of blend in and not be a presence of significance in the community around her. Well, her whole MO, her whole desire, comes to a screeching halt 
when this queen from a land, a distant fictional land called Genovia, travels across the Atlantic Ocean to come and visit her and meet with her and give her some earth-shattering news. The queen tells Mia Thermopolis, this little, you know, 15-year-old girl, by the way, you never knew this about your dad, but your dad was a prince. He was the prince of this land called Genovia. He just passed away. You never knew him. But what that means is you are the next in line in this royal lineage, and you are being given the responsibility to rule and to represent this distant land. And for my daughter, she's thinking like, that'd be the best news ever. Are you kidding me? A queen coming from a distant land to tell me that I'm a princess? Like she's been waiting every day. She's been praying every day for a moment like that. But you have this girl, Mia Thermopolis, where this is not good news. This is the most burdensome news she could possibly receive. Because all of a sudden, this, this new identity that is being revealed to her, it's not even being given to her. It's not something for her to accept. It's something that she already is, whether she likes it or not. But she is being given an opportunity to step in and represent this identity. And she's thinking about all of the pressure, all of the royal pain that will be associated with taking on this calling. All of the responsibility, all the expectations, needing to uphold a certain reputation, not being able to have normal relationships after that anymore. All of a sudden, you're put in this position where you're in the crowd, but you're not of the crowd. You don't fit in. Everyone's looking to you, and there's a weight that you carry. She's like, I don't know if I want to carry this cross. I don't know if I want to step into this identity fully. I hope that there's a light bulb turning on for somebody in the house of God today. Because as we read this chapter in Isaiah 61, what, what's so amazing to me is, is Isaiah the prophet is prophesying about our coming Messiah, King Jesus. He is the high priest. He is the king of kings. He is the savior of our souls who has prophesied to come to free us from the bondage of our sin and to give us a new identity. Is anyone excited about that? Am I the only one? Am I the only one who was a sinner, who was wretched, who was wicked? If I could put my, my past on here, we'd have to kick out everybody under 17. Because my past is so disgusting in the light of who I was actually called to be. And God took a man, a broken man like this, who had no identity, who was an ambassador for the kingdom of darkness, he plucked me out of my sin and he put me into his family. Not just to be a servant of God, but to be a friend of God. And let me tell you today, it's not because I'm sweet, it's not because I started going to church, it's because I was in desperation of knowing who this God was and he freely gave me an identity that I didn't deserve. And it's the same for everybody here, if you call upon the name of Jesus. Let me tell you, your purpose in life is not just to try to hold on for dear life and hope that you don't sin before you get to heaven. That's survival. That's not life. Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. He didn't just die to forgive you of your sin. He died to transform your nature. And even on your worst day, I'm talking to someone right now, Jeff, even on your worst day, he doesn't look at you and regret you. He chose you before the foundations of the earth, knowing how jacked up you were and how you would still fall short. And he still looked at you before you were created in your mother's womb and said, Jeff is worth it. Jeff is destined to be a royal priest. And that's the same. Praise God. Receive it, bro. I think we've... we've oversimplified this thing to, to something that Jesus never intended for it to be. Jesus didn't die to give us a religion to follow. He died to give us a life to become. Purpose. You have a purpose. You have a purpose beyond survival. But a lot of us are not leaning into that purpose, if we can be completely honest, because of the pressure associated with that purpose because of the responsibility, because of the expectation. 
of carrying this amazing call to be a royal priest. But let me tell you this. I'll kind of just give you the cliff notes. Hopefully I can get through the whole message today. We'll see how much time we have. Holy Spirit will lead. He always does it. He does a better job than I do anyway, so we'll give it to him. But let me tell you this. Jesus has not set you up for failure. He set you up for success. You're not a victim. You are more than an overcomer through him who loves you. He wants you to win. He's your biggest fan. He's your biggest cheerleader. And he is standing up at the throne of grace when you take a step of faith into your identity and walk out your purpose regardless of what it costs you. And he's looking at you and he's saying, Dad, look at our beloved servant in whom we're well pleased. So excited for you to hear the words well done when you cross that finish line. We need to believe that about our God. And so my desire and my hope today is that for anybody in here who's been walking through an unreasonable amount of pressure recently, that you don't take it as a punishment from God, but you recognize, no, this is actually privilege, okay? Purpose, someone say purpose. Let's start with purpose. First Peter chapter two, verse nine, it says this, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. If you're taking notes, if you got your Bible open, if you got a pencil, a mechanical pencil, you got a ballpoint, big pen, I want you to underline, circle, star the words royal priests. Someone say royal priests. You are royal priests. What on earth does that mean? It sounds cool, but what does that really look like? Here's what's amazing. We need to not look any further than the person of Jesus to understand what it means to be a royal priest and what our responsibility is. Because Jesus is the king of kings, and Jesus is our great high priest. So we look to him, and we look at, royal, we look at priests, and we look at kings throughout the Bible, and what are those responsibilities? I want to share just a couple of them with you right now. For a king, you could write down these two. As kings, kings are called to represent or be ambassadors of the nation that they're called to rule. And number two, kings, particularly back then, were called to be on the front lines when they waged war. It wasn't like how it is today where a king or a president or a prime minister can wage war and sit in the comfort of their office while everybody else goes and sacrifices their lives. No, back in the day, kings would actually be on the front lines and lead the troops into battle. That's the type of leader that our King Jesus is. Jesus doesn't just tell us to go out into the world as sheep among wolves. No, Jesus taught us how to expand the kingdom of God, even through pressure. He modeled it for us. And let me tell you, this is something that's really important for you and for me to recognize. What does it mean for us to be a royal priesthood? It doesn't mean that we just come into the four walls of the church for 90 minutes on a Sunday, and we operate in an area of serving here, which is great and beautiful, and praise God for every way that you guys are serving God in this house. But what it looks like is for us to go out there and be an ambassador, not as citizens of the United States of America, but as citizens of heaven. Meaning everywhere we go, we are contending for the standards and the principles of our homeland. Everywhere we go, we are representing our kingdom in enemy-occupied territory. Talk about pressure. As priests, here's the two things we can recognize as priests. We're called to minister to God, and we're called to be bridge builders. Think about the L logo for Love Church. Ministers to God, but bridge builders between a dying world and this amazing, gracious God who is willing that no one shall perish. And we're called to go into the, the difficult places, the difficult relationships, and be long-suffering with people who don't even want to know him and represent his kindness and his goodness for the goodness of God brings men to repentance. And let me tell you guys, love church, I wanna just tell you how proud I am of you. 
Because I see it. I hear the stories. I hear the stories of some of you staying up late at night counseling people who are going through the most crazy divorces. Dealing with prodigal children running from home. Working with people who are trying to overcome addiction and trying to receive this purpose and identity for themselves. And I just want to say, man, it is such an honor to be a part of a house where there are people who are receiving and walking in this great purpose. But I also want to give a healthy challenge because I also believe for as many people who are walking in that identity and are embracing it, there's other people who recoil at this amazing gift. Delegating the work of priestly ministry, of being an ambassador out in the culture to those who are on stage, to the professionals, to the small group leaders. Guys, last time I read this, this wasn't a word for the pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. This is a word for the saints. This is a work that we all need to do, but a lot of us step back. A lot of us don't want to be out in the open. A lot of us don't want to step out and give a prophetic word, share our faith, because all of a sudden, when we let people know about who we are and the kingdom that we represent, all of a sudden, there's all these expectations that are put on us to represent that thing well. And all of a sudden, we feel like, oh my gosh, like, there's no way I can do this well. There's no way I can do it perfectly. Newsflash, Jesus knew that when he called us into this. And he's not surprised. Is that, a, is that a license for us to just go uh, nosedive into sin? No, but we need to recognize that Jesus, when he called his starting 12 to go and begin planting the church, he picked like the worst dudes on paper. And I'm not about like, you know, comparing laterally, but you can compare to some of these people in the Bible and say, if God could use a Peter to encourage a persecuted church, the guy who denied Jesus three times, who was restored and then was willing to be martyred for his faith, crucified, not right side up, but upside down because he himself said he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. If he could do it. Same Holy Spirit that rested upon Peter is the same Holy Spirit that rests upon you today. But let me, uh, let me share this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what it says in verses seven through 10. It says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars. Oh, that's so encouraging, great. Containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. Hallelujah. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies, okay? Here's the word I want you to write down, pressure. Someone say pressure. We cannot walk in the resurrection power of Jesus without walking through the crucifixion of Jesus. Babe, can you hand me that, um, there's a little prop, it should be on my backpack right under Stephanie right there. You see that? Oh, thank you so much, love ya. Anyone know what one of these is? I heard a message, actually Donna shared it with me. There's this lady, uh, her, her name is Melissa Helser. She and her husband Jonathan have this podcast and. She was talking about this story about how she was like, she was gardening and she was using one of these numbers to like spray her flowers or spray her tomatoes or whatever. And uh, she was deeply frustrated because, you know, this thing is meant to apply a certain amount of pressure to be able to water something, you know, pretty, pretty significantly. But there wasn't a lot of pressure coming out of the hose. She tried opening up the, the spigot even more and there still wasn't enough pressure. And she caught herself under her breath Kind of like, oh, no, no. you know how like you're frustrated and you just like start talking to yourself? She's talking to herself. She's like, I just wish there was more pressure. And the Holy Spirit said to her, that's right. You need more pressure. And she was like, no, Lord, that's not what I meant. I wasn't talking about that. 
And the Holy Spirit so gently said, no, 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 you're missing what I'm trying to teach you right now. Because you see, Melissa Helser, her story, she, she's had a chronic illness that she's been struggling with for years, and she's been praying for breakthrough, and she's in a house of God, a house of miracles, where she's seeing miracles break out for people around her, but she's not experiencing the same breakthrough that she's contending for and seeing in other people. So she's experiencing a unique pressure, not a release of pressure, and, and she's honestly thinking, this can't be possibly the will of God for my life. And the Holy Spirit says to her three times, you need more pressure. And the reason why this was such a significant word for her and is a significant word for me, and I hope it's a significant word for somebody else right now, is because for so long, even right now, some of you are going through a season of significant pressure, relational pressure, health pressure pressure, financial pressure, spiritual pressure, disappointment pressure. And what Jesus is doing, he is not punishing you. Your pressure is not a punishment. It is a privilege. And what he's doing is he's squeezing you and me so that the life of Jesus can come out in power to the people around us. Let me tell you right now, the pressure that you're walking through right now that you're feeling or you sense is coming. You know when a storm is coming and all of a sudden there's atmospheric pressure. Something's changing. Something's on the horizon and we better buckle up and we better be prepared in season and out of season. God uses this pressure oftentimes as the answer to our prayers. Some of you have been praying for breakthrough. You've been praying for God to give you vision, to usher you into a new chapter. And you're like, I'm experiencing everything that I wasn't praying for. This isn't exactly how I thought it would pan out. Let me tell you, this could be the very thing that God needs to do in you to pull out the thing that you're praying for right now. No pressure. No power. No pressure. No prize. No prize. I hope that this just resonates with somebody right now that you would see that though you are walking through tremendous pressure, it is not a sign that God has abandoned you. It could be a sign. It could be a word from God that he has not abandoned you, but that he is inside of you and he just wants to escape through you to splash onto the world around you. Let me tell you right now, your purpose in this season might be for the world around you to watch you go through pressure and continue to praise God through it. Because the world is tired of empty promises. The world is tired of blab it and grab it and name it and claim it and manifest your destiny and life is all about you and me and our comfort. It never was anyway, it's all an illusion. But the world is looking for something more meaningful. So that even when we go through the most horrendous circumstances, is there purpose in it? Is there a God sovereign over it? And when you and I allow the pressure of life to not destroy us, but to perfect us and allow the power of God to come through us. There's a prize. Isaiah 61, verse eight. It says, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Yeah. What's the reward? Is it a Disney cruise? That'd be cool. I'm not against Disney cruises. I went on a handful of them as a kid. They're awesome. All you can eat ice cream. It's amazing. Is the prize a new, uh, a new Kia? Is the prize braces for all your kids? All the kids are like, no, definitely not that. You know, God is in the business of rewarding on this side of eternity. It's, it's true. I've seen it. I've lived it. But let's not get distracted by that. Because there's a greater reward waiting for us in heaven. And what is that reward? It's him. It's more of him. And God's been really challenging me lately. He's been asking, Cap, what do you want? What do you really want? I'll provide all the stuff you need. I'll give you more than you need. Every good gift comes from me. And I give you these things to richly enjoy, but what are you really after? If heaven was not filled with all the toys and trinkets and rewards and crowns, would I be enough for you? 
would unfiltered access to me be enough? Would my glory and presence and robe filling the temple of heaven be enough for you? And honestly, I had to really wrestle with that because I was thinking, man, well, there's a part of me that really loves material stuff. And he said, Cap, if, if that's not what you're about, you might not really like heaven. You might as well go to hell. And I, well, he didn't say that to rebuke me. He just said that because he wanted me to know, like, Cap, like, you need to refocus where your priorities are. What's the real prize? He's the prize. Well, that's a close one. <laughs> I almost lost my iPad there. I want to close with this. I want to share just a really brief story. I'm going to try to summarize it as quickly as possible. This story is really, this message is very personal for me. Because um, last year I went through like probably the hardest year of my life. Um, to kind of spare you a ton of the details. My business got flipped upside down profitably. We're hemorrhaging money. I was taking on debt to keep people employed. Pressure. Simultaneously, my wife was um, diagnosed with a chronic illness that our health insurance decided not to cover. So we were bleeding out our emergency savings to pay for emergency room visits and all that sort of stuff. Pressure. And I remember being on my face in my office and just crying out to God, just saying, God, what gives? Because I know my purpose. This pressure, I didn't realize that this was part of the bill here. And God said to me so lovingly, he said, Cap, I can't be bought off with a tithe. You and I had a deal. You told me that you wanted to use the business that I gave you to go and tell stories about me on the internet to create content for me. And you haven't been doing it, but I'm willing to give you another shot. I turned, I repented. And in a matter of 30 days, I hadn't even done anything for him yet, but the very fact that he had my heart in 30 days, he brought in more business than we had got the entire year and snuffed out our entire wildfire of debt completely. I don't want you to hear a health and wealth message here. I just want you to hear of God's faithfulness when you step into the call. And I came to January and, and he said, don't get too comfortable. I need to continue to apply some pressure so that the right thing comes out of you. January comes, I don't really have any income at that point. We have three to four months of savings to live off of. But I put a bet on God, and I said, God, I'm gonna go all in. I'm gonna use the gift of filmmaking and digital marketing that you've given me to make you famous on the internet. And I'm just gonna start cranking out videos on social media. And it was amazing, because it was a four-month window that I was just trusting God for. And if I can be honest, there was a halfway point where I wanted to tap so bad Anybody in here have a video of them go viral where they're just, their name and their reputation is being dragged through the mud? Oh, we have one. Cool. You and I, bro. We're in this together. <laughs> I wasn't expecting anybody, but the reality is, is that's a type of pressure that not a lot of people are going to walk through. It's a lonely place to be. And in this moment where I'm thinking, God, I'm just trying to honor you to the best that I can. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I'm fumbling my way through this. But what gives? I'm trying to be faithful. Now I'm trying to be faithful to you. And now my name is being dragged through the mud. And I was in a shower. I was in a shower. We were in Texas. And I was like kind of moping before God. You ever have a moment like that? I was just moping before God, just like being an Eeyore. And I was just like, God, like, why aren't you fixing this scenario? Like, why aren't you changing our income? And why aren't you, like, honoring what I'm doing for you? And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Cap, if I took away all the pressure right now, and I just put the money in your bank account, would you be happy? I said, no. He said, that's right. Because if everything around you changed but you didn't change, it'd all be worthless. He said, Cap, I'm squeezing you right now to bring something out of you that's been in there for so long. Cap, I didn't call you to be an entrepreneur first. I didn't call you to be a filmmaker first. I called you to be a priest. I called you to be a preacher. I called you to represent me to the world. 
So I say, God, thank you for lovingly reminding me that it's not about me. It's not about me. So I kept on charging, and here's what's amazing. This is, the, this is kind of the cool ending of this story. Is in a matter of four to five months, the Lord grew a following on social media, about 5,500 5, followers, and he grew it to 1.5 million over six months, where people all over the world are receiving the gospel in a language they can understand. Yeah, praise God for that, man. It's not about me. It's not about Cap Chatfield's name being recognized amongst complete strangers. It's about the name of Jesus being recognized amongst complete strangers. It's about the people that DM me saying, Cap, I was about to commit suicide tonight, but I saw your video pop up on YouTube shorts and it made me think twice. Just wanted to thank you for that. It's about the people who message saying, Cap, I'm on the verge of divorce right now. My wife just left me and I just need someone to pray for me. It's about the people who reach out saying, there's not a Bible-believing church near me. It's about people from Saudi Arabia who are not even allowed to worship God publicly, who are able to wake up at two o'clock in the morning to be a part of a live stream Bible study so that they can receive the word of God in a way that makes sense. What a prize. What a prize. That I would get to know him in this way and be conformed to this image. And that I would get to be a royal priest. Let me encourage you, church. Don't lean away from the pressure. Don't lean away from the pressure. The pressure is a sign. The pressure is a sign of the legitimacy of your purpose. Accept it so that we can receive the prize. Amen.